the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Josh Berger. And I'm Brian Lomax. And in this episode, we're going to discuss stress and coping in tennis. More specifically, what do we typically get stressed out about when we practice and compete? And what strategies do players generally use to deal with that stress? So here to discuss those topics with us today is Dr. Laura Swetnam. Laura is a sport and exercise psychologist from the UK, chartered with the British Psychological Society. She has experience working with within a range of sports, predominantly professional football or soccer, as we say in the United States, youth tennis, and esports. In these contexts, Laura uses acceptance and mindfulness approaches, such as acceptance and commitment therapy, to support the athletes and coaches so that they can thrive in and out of their performance environments. Currently, Laura works at Cultivate Academy, a regional player development center for tennis in Northern England, and she's the sports psychology and coach development lead at the Federation of Esports Coaches. She's also an associate partner lecturer at the University of Portsmouth and has published multiple research papers within sports psychology utilizing the Think Aloud protocol. In tennis, Laura's explored stress and coping using Think Aloud, which we will discuss in much more detail today. With that, here is our conversation with Dr. Laura Swettenham. Hey, Laura, welcome to the Tennis IQ podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here today. And, and again, thanks for being here. Yeah. Hey, guys, thanks so much for asking me. Um, yeah, look forward to having a chat today. Yeah. I mean, this is a topic. I know Josh and I have been excited about having you on, on the, the podcast to talk about stress and coping in tennis, you know, sort of the unique natures of that with, with respect to the sport and some of the research that you've done with a protocol called Think Aloud, which I thought was really interesting the first time I heard about it. Um, but before we get into all of that, it'd be great for you to introduce yourself to the audience about how you got involved with tennis, whether as a player or whatever, and then into sports psychology and, and where you are today. Yeah, sure. So I, I started playing tennis myself probably later than kind of most people were. So I think I was about 12 when I started playing. Um, but then continued to play like when I went to university um, with yeah, the uni-, uni teams there. And I, I guess w- within that, I started to notice that when I was warming up with, um, with my opponents, I always felt like they were much better than me. But actually, when we got into the actual competition itself, it kind of evened out a little bit. And I often came out, you know, on, on top. Um, And so that started getting me really interested in the psychological side of the game. So I was doing a a BSc in just pure psychology at the time. And I guess my experiences in tennis um, there at uni made me want to go and do more research into, you know, sports psychology. And so that kind of took me down to do a master's in, in sports psych. And yeah, at the moment, just trying to work more in, in, in tennis and, and research in tennis. So. Yeah, certainly uh, it's a sport that challenges people from, you know, like what, even what you mentioned, there's that appraisal of like me versus the other, right? My capabilities versus theirs and the thoughts that brings up. But it's interesting how you worked through it through a match and perhaps it was your mental toughness that got you through and, and won some of those. Yeah, I think certainly some of them. And then on the flip side with a lot of them too, I think when I was playing, uh, you know, so some of these kind of more competitive matches, I guess, I would experience quite a lot of performance anxiety myself. And that could also, you know, just be the flip of the coin and the thing that um, give, gives away the match. So I think personally, and maybe on a bit of a selfish level, I wanted to explore the, the psychological side of it so that I could better manage my own stresses my own anxieties um, on the court as well. Yeah, I think that sort of parallels my approach to, uh, or how I got involved in this, is that it was really selfish and <laughs> yeah. developing my own program to try to make myself better. And uh, and then it sort of blossomed from there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, just in general, stressors in tennis, um, perhaps different ones between, say, practice and competition. And maybe we can begin to start to tie this to some of the research that you've done so that our audience can learn a little bit more about this and and eventually share some coping strategies. Yeah, sure. So I guess guess thinking about the way that we kind of categorize some of our stresses that we identified within the research, we came up with like four 
different types of stresses or kind of themes for them. Um, and this was across practice and competition, uh, but I suppose we can talk about the nuances of that um, kind of later on. So these four were around confidence. So whether it's like a lack of confidence or some sort of concern, I suppose, about whether we're going to reach our goal, whether we're going to win. Um, so there's that one, so the confidence. Then we had a performance stressor, which is probably the one that we see pretty frequently within tennis. So this one may be to do with like the outcome of the point, technical, tactical sides of, of things. Um, then we have our external stressors. So, you know, whatever's happening perhaps outside of the court, maybe it's people watching, maybe it's to do with our opponent. Um, maybe, yeah, it's to do with our own kind of, uh, I suppose, like distractions that the environment might give us. And the last one is the physical stresses. So around maybe it's injury, maybe you've got some niggles, uh, or maybe it's simply a bit of fatigue, a bit of exhaustion. So these things are all things that we, we identify with some of our research for what tennis players might appraise as a stressful situation. And um, could, could you tell us a little bit more about um, you know, how through how, how some of that research started, how some of um, you, you you took some of your own experiences and started to bring that into an academic setting and a little bit more about um, an introduction to think aloud and how that ties into coping with some of these stressors? Yeah, sure. So, so it was on my MSc. So it was a, a few years back now and I was introduced to um, someone called Dr. Amy Whitehead, who is one of my, my good friends and, and has been my supervisor as well throughout my training. Um, and she has done a lot of research within Think Aloud. And we both kind of had a bit of connection on the tennis side of things and thought it'd be really exciting if we could, number one, see if Think Aloud was viable within tennis. But then, yeah, exploring more specifically these kind of stress and coping mechanisms. So I think from, like I say, from my previous experience, uh, this was something that, of course, is quite prominent within tennis. And can we start to see, you know, what are the coping mechanisms that are in place? But then also, you know, I suppose in a more applied sense, how can we start to increase our coping resources so that we can manage these stresses better when we are actually on the court? Um, yeah, so, so do you want me to say a little bit about what Think Aloud is and, and kind of how we used it there? Yeah, I think that'd be great. I mean, I, I first heard of it because I heard Dr. Amy Whitehead on Dan Abraham's Sports Psych Show podcast. Yeah, yeah. And I, had, I think I sent her a direct message on Twitter about tennis and she pointed me to you. Oh, great. About that, right? And then I, yeah. you know, we found your research paper and so forth. So. I found it fascinating in listening to her explanation, but so if you could explain that um, and then, you know, how you trained people to do it, I think it's really a very interesting way of uh, understanding what's happening and, and also why you use it. Yeah, sure. So, so Think Aloud, it was originally used, I think, within nursing to explore kind of cognitive processes and decision making it, it, within nursing practice um, and of course we've been exploring it a bit more within sport and you can use think aloud on a few different levels so level one of think aloud would simply be um, you're kind of saying out loud what your your inner speech might be for example um, and then you have a dictaphone or a microphone or even just some airpods in and you're saying that out loud and recording it and then we move on to to level two think aloud so here you're doing the same sort of things where you're verbalizing your kind of inner speech or inner kind of thought processes, but you're also um, kind of putting into verbal code things that might not be already. So this might be things like our senses, for example. So if we think about maybe it's just what I'm looking at, maybe I'm noticing the, the ball kid kind of running across the court, I might be saying that out loud um, in this kind of level two, or maybe it's recognizing you know the smells around me for example or the sounds so in level two you get a little bit more than just what would naturally be within our you know verbal coding if you like and that's what we use a lot with athletes and then the level three which we probably won't touch too much on here but it's something we might use more with coaches so this is where we're actually thinking about our thinking 
So again, you're thinking out loud, but then you're questioning yourself. Oh, I wonder why I'm thinking this way or what does this mean for my athletes, for example. But when we were doing this research, we were purely looking at this level two. So we were basically instructing the, the players to verbalize out loud anything that comes to mind. So, you know, nothing is too mundane and kind of asking them just to kind of work through the, their thought processes, but saying it out loud. And importantly here, we didn't get them to do this all the time. So whilst they're actually, you know, in the middle of a point, we weren't getting them to think aloud. So it was very clear that it was in between points at the back of the court, think aloud during that time. And of course, this is just so that we make sure we're not messing with any of those like automatic, um, you know, processes and, and things. So, yeah, that's kind of how, how we used it, it, it there. Yeah, well, I, I think that's that's very interesting, especially um, as you were saying with with level two incorporating some of the senses, um, and you know maybe maybe you weren't as focused on um, the level three, but um, also sort of that that met metacognition piece of thinking about your own thinking and and mm -hmm. how maybe common you know commenting on on what you might be thinking or saying in that moment. I think that's um, th that that's another interesting dimension. Um, so what were, can, can you tell us a little bit more? I know you were utilizing it um, in between points and we, we've talked a lot on this podcast about the importance of how tennis players can, can maximize that time that they spend in between points. Um, but, you know, on, on the practice court, how, how that w w was utilized um, for, for players a little bit more about the, the actual, um, the methods of how, how it took place. And then some of the, the findings in terms of, of coping with stress. Yeah, sure. So we, we did a little bit of kind of think aloud training, if you like, with them beforehand. And, and this can look quite simple. So, um, for example, we might show them a few dots on the, on the page and ask them to tell us, you know, out loud how they're working, uh, working to the answer of how many dots are in front of them. So, you know, it might be doing like, you know, three times two equals Six, and then they're saying that out loud. So we really want them to practice going through the process, not just giving us the answer, but telling us kind of what's happening before that. So we have a few little exercises like that that we might do. Um, and yeah, give them a little bit of a chance to practice it in action as well before we go into say, the proper data collection um, phase. And I think as well, if, if people are considering to use this within actual, you know, applied practice, I suppose, more than research, it is recognizing that it can take a bit of time to become comfortable to do this because it can be quite vulnerable uh, when we are saying all of these, you know, things that we might keep inside. Maybe it's quite a lot of self-criticism. Maybe it's I don't know, like saying something bad about our opponent even. It might not be things that we particularly want other people to hear. So it certainly is a bit of a skill to build up being able to think aloud, um, you know, everything that is coming to mind. And I think with that as, as well, if you are then sharing that with somebody, let's say, for example, um, in an applied kind of scenario, sharing that with your coach or you are sharing that with your sports psychologist, it might take a little bit of time just to feel comfortable with that because um, there can be quite a bit of apprehension, I think, at the beginning to to engage with them. So. Which makes sense. You know, I was actually, as you were talking, think about it, I played a match last night and it's a place that has a lot of distractions. There's a backboard right mm -hmm. next to the court. There's a basketball court. And last night there were a lot of a lot of music being played. And I know my thoughts were kind of like, oh, that sounds offensive. But uh, or this is a lot of noise here. And this is a lot of stuff in my visual piece that I was thinking about. Like if I had to think aloud, hmm, there's a lot of content there yeah. aside from what was happening just in the match. Yeah, itself. definitely. Right. Um, and so what are some of the things that, you know, at a general level, when you examined what these players were saying, right, when you started to look at the content, what were some mm -hmm. themes that that emerged with um, this level? And maybe describe the level, Laura, because when I read the study, it wasn't apparent to me exactly. I think you mentioned like a, a like a level one club or something, which it, I didn't relate that necessarily to like a UTR or something. So I wasn't sure of the exact level. Yeah, so we kind of have a mix of two levels, really. So we had some uh, like university 
level players um, from the the unit at Liverpool John Moores. And we also had some um, kind of quite high high performing at like a club level, um, kind of mixing in as well. So it was, yeah, a mix of the two, but they were all kind of frequent competitors and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And then it, when we looked, I suppose then coming back to this idea of stress and coping, so what we were doing was we, we took that think aloud data. So they did this during practice and competition. And this was a competition that we had manipulated ourselves. So it wasn't a real competition, but um, we, we did kind of do some tests around anxiety. So a kind of questionnaire. So we could see if anything was changing between the two um, settings that we had kind of artificially created. And we did see that there was an increase in, cognitive anxiety um, in the competition condition. So we can see that, you know, there was some sort of change there, but I think it's also to keep in mind that of course, it's very difficult to replicate that real kind of feeling under pressure. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, so, so that was kind of the setup. So we had practice and competition, and they were thinking loud in between points here. And then we took that the, the data and kind of looked at that for the stress and coping responses. So we identified the stresses that we mentioned before. So in terms of the whether it was confidence, performance, external um, or kind of physical stressor. And then what we did was we looked to see how were they coping with this once they verbalized you know, the stress that they experienced. So we looked this into kind of three different categories based on previous research. So, so this was um, problem-focused coping. So when we're trying to, you know, solve the problem that we might be experiencing or kind of remove the problem. So this might be as, as basic as, okay, I've hit the ball in the net. What can I do to fix that? Maybe I need to hit up, you know, more up the back through the ball, get it a bit higher over the net. So it could be as basic as that um, in your problem focused. And then we have emotion focus. So we're looking more at through kind of emotional regulation. How are we managing this stress within the environment? And then the last one is avoidance focused coping. So as we might, as it kind of sounds, we're kind of avoiding the, the stressor or we might be using humor, or maybe a bit of sarcasm just to, you know, get away from <laughs> away from it. So within both the, the practice and competition conditions here, we saw that they were most often using um, problem-focused coping and they were most often experiencing the, the performance stressor. So this was a, across both for both males and females. That was the one that was coming up the most often there. And did you happen to tie any of this, say, to the results of the competition? So, for example, did... Did the people who did better in the competition use one particular coping strategy, say, more so than the ones who finished at the bottom of the table? No, we didn't actually. So we we actually we got a bit of the data in term because we did record it and got kind of the point outcomes. But just because this was a bit of an early experimentation kind of with Think Aloud and, and so forth, we didn't go that far with it. But it is something we're considering looking back into the data and and seeing later down the line. Um but, but no, we, we didn't we didn't look at that in, in this instance. Yeah, I think that'd be kind of fascinating. What do you think, Josh? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To to see to to, to see the results and see how um, comparing uh, cer certain types and and which which types were more successful. I, I guess the dimension I I was thinking about is training training players using using this this protocol and thinking about how can. Um, as sports psychology practitioners, as, as coaches as well. I know we have a lot of tennis coaches that listen. Um, how, can we, um, how can we help players to, to utilize some of these protocols, probably more on the, on the practice court, you'd think, but um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of boosting their success, um, maybe in terms of, Laura, I'm curious if you have some, some thoughts on some, some best practices. Yeah, sure. So I think something that's really great about Think Aloud is it can be really versatile. Um, and so I guess if we, I guess to start with sticking with this maybe stressing coping side of it and then speaking about maybe how else we could use Think Aloud as well. Um, but so, so in terms of the stressing coping, what we can obviously do is quite similar to what we did in the research is you can hook your athlete up to a, a microphone and then see, okay, what are they experiencing as a stressor? And then if we look at some of these kind of stress and coping models, 
we're then seeing is the athlete experiencing a stress response or have they recognized that they can they, or they do have the coping resources to manage with this stressful situation and put that coping response into action. So I think that's something that, that we can start to identify and can probably start to identify a bit initially without Think Aloud, but then start to get some more nuances by using Think Aloud in there and really seeing what's happening when, say, my players experiencing, you know, every time we get to juice, they're starting to, um, you know, appraise this situation as stressful and they can't cope with it. So what we want to try and do is balance out those coping resources so that when the athlete is like, okay, this is something I'm finding really stressful, that's all right. But then they can say, yeah, I actually, I know what I can do here. My past experiences says I need to do X, Y, and Z, or maybe we've done some training on, I don't know, mindfulness or self-talk or um, certain routines and maybe that's a way that they can use some of their their kind of coping responses to help reduce a, a, the stress response so that, that 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 definitely makes sense i i could definitely see the the tie-in to to mindfulness as well and awareness um from from going through this and um hearing what what you're saying to yourself or sometimes some of these um some of our self-talk can be just so automatic or so ingrained, but actually being able to hear it out loud and sometimes hearing the um, some of that negativity or the way that people talk to themselves or the way that people are appraising a situation can um, actually hearing it out loud can I, I think that definitely lead to some more self awareness and, and hopefully change change some of that self talk um, for the better. So absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I think that we can then start to use it as almost like a bit of a monitoring tool, so we can see. Is this um, self-talk changing? Is even, I think what's actually quite cool about Think Aloud is that we are tapping into those senses as well. So we might be able to actually see if your player is starting to become more mindful on the court by, by using Think Aloud. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's great in terms of that, I suppose, initial needs analysis what maybe do we need to look at? What do we need to intervene with? And then we can yeah, use it to monitor, are we making progress throughout and what does that look like? And I think even just on its own, even like, like you say here, Josh, even if we're, we're kind of not intervening, we've still got some really, um, I think positive outcomes just in that self-awareness piece. Um, so yeah, we're starting to recognize, actually, I'm, I wouldn't talk to anybody else in that way. Why am I talking to myself like this? So I think that can be really powerful in itself. And, and if you get to a point where you feel comfortable to, you know, share that with your, your coaching team, that's, you know, showing that vulnerability can really support, you know, building relationships and even like building a bit of psychological safety within, within that um, maybe support system that you have. I recall one of the reasons that Think Loud was, um, was utilized in different studies from the conversation that, that um, Dr. Amy Whitehead had with Dan Abrahams was that there can be a memory decrement when one tries to report what you said afterwards, right? And that this helps as long as you're well-trained on Think Aloud and, and you're, you're verbalizing a lot of these things. Um, so I think that's actually fascinating because I think a lot of people, they may even filter what they tell you as a coach or a sports psych practitioner um to maybe make it sound better right and then maybe some of that filtering happens even at the beginning uh when somebody's first using it like i don't think i want to say that out loud um yeah but when you start to so let me ask you laura when do you have players that you work with do this and then examine the content of that and and then help them through some of that and if you do that you know what how do you do that and and, and what are some of the things that you've tried to help people sort of accept in terms of their thoughts and, and maybe mm -hmm. respond to them better. Yeah, sure. So often what we'll do is kind of, I suppose, set it up as a bit of an experiment to start with, um, just to kind of see how they find it, see, because some people are amazing at it and just go straight into it. Whereas we've had some um, kind of tennis players in the past who have, have been like, I need to turn this off. Like I feel so uncomfortable, yeah. like, saying what I'm thinking out loud, like, let, we need to stop. So, so with, say with a situation like that, 
it might actually be getting them to practice think aloud in a completely different context. Maybe like whilst they're at home, whilst they're in a more comfortable environment, get used to saying their thoughts out loud before moving it back on the tennis court. But for those people who kind of feel a bit more comfortable and, and maybe if you built a bit of relationship with them and they're happy to share it with you, I think it's really powerful yeah, to sit down, listen through to the, the think aloud together and, and maybe you're pinpointing certain areas. So you're thinking, okay, what's going on here? What's, what's maybe coming up in your verbalizations frequently that might be, you know, pushing you around a bit. Is there anything that's getting in the way of you being at your best and who you want to be? So you might identify those things um, like within the think aloud and then look to intervene in certain areas but then also keep re repeating the think aloud process not all the time maybe every couple of weeks or so you I don't think you want to be doing it all the time um but yeah say so then starting to implement certain approaches so so my I suppose philosophy of, of practice takes me to a more mindfulness and acceptance based approach so um, so I use things like acceptance and commitment therapy, for example. So what often we can notice within the think aloud is thoughts that we might be really fused with. So maybe it's I'm the worst tennis player ever, you know, like, oh, I can't believe I've, I've missed this shot. Um, now I'm going to lose. What's everyone going to think about me? You know, I'm going to let my parents down, going to let my coaches down. We can start to see that, that some of these thoughts can really get in the way. So we can then start to, what often what I'll do is go through a bit of an, an act um, kind of process in what we might call the, the triflex. I don't know if you guys have, you know, come across that much before in your own practices or. Not so much that particular method. So I'd love to hear you explain that. Yeah, yeah sure. So. So I guess, yeah, if we think about the, the triflex then from acceptance to commitment therapy, um, it starts with be present. So this bit is, it can be tied with mindfulness practice. It can simply be tied, I guess, more informal forms of uh, mindfulness or just self-awareness practice. So again, think aloud can be really nice to, to work on there. Um, or I might implement, like I say, some sort of more formal mindfulness training for, for them if needed. But then we move on to kind of the next um, area, which would be open up. So this would be um, when we're trying to get players to recognize that they are not their thoughts and feelings, you know, so that they are kind of the context of which their thoughts and feelings are arising, right? So we're trying to get that little bit more separation for them. So maybe we've identified some of those thoughts which are really pushing them around within the think aloud um, and then starting to target them here and, and use something that we call diffusion techniques. So, you know, this is, say, for example, if we go back to that thought of I'm the worst tennis player in the world, maybe to diffuse that, we're, we're just adding a bit onto it. So I notice I'm having the thought that I'm the worst tennis player in the world. And the more kind of we practice that and look into it, we get that little bit more space. So again, we're starting to recognize we are not these thoughts and feelings. And what that does is then gives the um, athlete a bit more space to respond in the way that they want to or in, in a way that's in line with their values. So I guess if we're coming back to stress and coping, this might be instead of experiencing that stress response, we're showing more of a coping response and more positive behaviors afterwards. And I guess that kind of takes us nicely onto this kind of last bit within ACT, which is do what matters. So this bit is all about your values. So it could be specifically performance values. So, you know, what sort of player do you want to be on the court? Or it could be more personal about what's happening off court as well in, in their kind of personal lives. But then the real key thing here is the values driven action. So behaviors. So, okay, if you're going to live in line with this value of, um, let's say it's integ integrity, maybe it's kind of hard work. What does that look like? What would we see you doing if you were living in line with, with this kind of value? And then hopefully we can put that into some really kind of concrete behaviors for them on court. So they have got, you know, okay, if I experience this thought, I can get some space from it. Then I can refocus and commit on what's really important to me in the moment. And so, yeah, I think that that for me is something that's been really useful to use with tennis players in the past. And I think is really complemented 
with Think Aloud, like I say, in that initial analysis and then and monitoring throughout of how they might be using, say, these diffusion techniques or these kind of values in, in what they do. Yeah, when uh, go, go, going through that that three step process, that that triflex, um, that 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 third step of of do what matters, um, and sort of being able to to choose your response at that point, um, I, th I think it is really important. It's it's something we've we've talked about here of um, you know not just not just being reactive and reacting in a situation, but having the the presence of mind to be able to choose that response. And we've we've also talked. Um, about this acronym win win of like what's important now so mm -hmm. um taking it all into context and being able to choose that response and, and identify um what's important now i think that was jorge capistani um when our conversation with him um when that came up but i i, I really like this um th this model and and how this this can be can be utilized with with tennis players i i think um as, as you said, op opening up that, that self-awareness piece and that mindfulness um, piece mm -hmm. and helping players to, to gain a little bit more um, awareness of what, what's going through their head um, in a given time um, and, and how they, they might be talking to themselves and how they're appraising the situation, their opponent, the match. Um, I, I, I guess one, one question I have is um, you've talked about a couple of, of specific interventions um, are there any other interventions that um, can be linked to this think aloud model, either through your research or through some of your experience that that you found to be to be helpful? Mm, yeah, so I, I think kind of like I said previously, it can be really versatile think aloud. So whatever I suppose, um, I suppose maybe whatever issue you're kind of identifying within that, um, yeah, the audio you can then kind of go in and try to intervene with. So whether it's, like I said previously, maybe it's around self-talk, maybe there's things that you're trying to alter, trying to change. Maybe you're taking more of a REBT approach. So kind of the rational, rationalizing some of the irrational thoughts that you might be identifying. And again, this can be used to monitor and see if any kind of progress is changing there too. Um, but yeah, for me personally, it has mostly been around looking at the stress and coping side of things, looking around the act. Um, and something else that I think is really interesting, I haven't put into too much practice myself, but is around emotional intelligence. So in some interviews that we've been doing recently with um, sport and exercise psychology practitioners who've been we've been uh, exploring their use of Think Aloud with their own athletes, some of them are talking about using it to kind of notice where their athletes are at in terms of this emotional intelligence and then by sitting down and listening back to the audio maybe zooming into a certain situation and asking more questions about okay but what were you feeling there what was that emotion where did that kind of show up in in, in your body then we might be starting to in increase that awareness of emotions for for the athlete especially if it, for youth athletes and again can start to move through this through through think aloud so i think that's a, a really interesting angle to look at it from as, as well for sure um i think emotional intelligence is uh has implications across lots of different contexts in life as well i mean because there, there are certainly multiple types of intelligences um and I think tennis is, it's a unique sport in that it's, it's a combat sport, um, with, uh, the, the sport gives you many opportunities over the course of an hour and a half or two hours to judge yourself mm. between points. And, um, you know, some of the things that Josh and I have talked about is, you know, how significant really are points, right? Why are we really, are we putting too much emphasis on this one point versus trying to win a game or trying to win a set and understanding those types of things? Um, I would mm -hmm. think that'd be some interesting stuff that you could see in the data as well. Or like, are we really focusing on what is important? Um, yeah. Because being a combat sport, but one where we're taking breaks, I find that the first biggest opponent everybody has is the, is the person in the mirror themselves. And I think that would be something you could probably see in that. And then mm -hmm. um, once you become a smarter tennis player, you increase your tennis IQ, then you do a better job of shifting your focus onto the opponent mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. you're going to make them 
mentally uncomfortable. And I think this is, you know, you know, we had communicated prior to today where I was asking, all right, are some of these thoughts or stressors and then coping strategies, are they different at, say, an elite level, let's say sort of an ATP, WTA, top 500 level versus someone who is more of a, a club level player? Do you see differences in some of those? Or maybe you haven't studied that exactly, but even if just your opinion on that, Laura. Yeah, so we're having a bit of a think about this, and it, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys think too, but my kind of thoughts were potentially some of the more, I suppose, performance-based stresses might be reasonably similar in terms of, okay, I've hit the ball out. Okay, I've hit a double fall. Some of the higher pressure points. Maybe that is um, the stress is maybe needs a little bit more when you're at that elite level. However, I'd, I'd also question whether the athletes at that elite level have better coping resources and better experience managing these things so perhaps even though they're experiencing similar or even slightly more intense stresses at an elite level they may be better able to cope with them but then of course when we get into that that higher level we're seeing a lot more stresses I'd say in terms of the external ones so whether it's about you know, the media kind of, you know, the um, expectations on yourself, maybe it's that ranking, which is really in your mind. So I think that with that environment of the more elite setting, of course, that there, there, there comes more stress as I think added on top. Um, but again, it's all about how they then are able to, to manage those responses. And, and I was thinking also, about whether kind of identity comes into play a little bit here. So, and I was, I, initially I thought, well, maybe it's, this is more of an issue at an elite level because, you know, so much of their life is just consumed by tennis. They are tennis, their worth is upon whether they win or lose. However, I've seen this quite a lot at a club level as well, when people's, you know, that their worth is reliant upon how they perform at, at the weekend or how they perform against a, a, a friendly at the club. So, again, I think it, it can, can be similar in some ways, even though the context might seem quite different or we might initially assume that elite tennis is much more stressful, in which it is, but... Again, it's about how are we coping with it? How are we experiencing it? How are we appraising the stressful situation and, and things like that? I don't know if that sparked any thoughts for, for you both. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, no, I, I definitely would agree with what you were saying about that even at the, the club level or junior level or col college university level that um, the stakes aren't, aren't as high as, as the professional level where somebody's livelihood is based on their their results, um, it, can, it can often feel that way. Um, I think we've all, I know the three of us are all, are all tennis players and, you know, I'm sure most of our listeners are, and it, it, it feels really important in that moment. Maybe after the fact, you can take a step back and uh, put, put it into perspective. But um, yeah, even, even if it's, you know, it's a hobby or it's something that you like to do a few times a week, um, in the heat of the moment, it, it really feels as important as anything. So I, I think that's a, an important point that, um, that the, the, the way that um, people are appraising the, their, their performance and um, the, their own self-worth self -worth, um, is, can, can be similar, whether it's somebody at the elite level or, or anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I think we've um, talked a lot also. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, I was just going to mention um, about that, the kind of coping responses, I suppose, in that perhaps at a more elite level, athletes are required a little bit more to make those changes. You know, say for example, if we take classic example of Federer, so actually he needed to make some changes to the way that he was responding to some stresses within, within matches. Um, and therefore, yeah, he's better able to, to, to cope with that. But if those same things were happening at a more club level, perhaps, you know, there's not as much need to make a change and therefore, yeah, those, those stresses are, just, are still having more of an impact. So I think that can come into play with this here as well is what's the need to change and what's the need to actually be able to manage these responses that I'm experiencing. I think Novak Djokovic, who we've talked a lot about, is, um, is a good example of 
being able to do some of these things. And what I've liked about many of his press conferences is he's vulnerable enough to show that he's human, just like the rest of us, that he has the same sort of doubts that go through his mind, same sort of distractions. But through his mental training, he has learned to, you know, have more, have better distraction control and get back to a, a more full focus where say maybe the three of us or somebody else may take a little bit longer we may feel more of a, a distracted period before we're able to get back to where we need to go um mm -hmm. and we've pointed out many times like hey you know this is great Djokovic just has the same he thinks just like we do the same sort of doubts can i win um but then he shows how he thinks about it and he gets back to really what you're saying is you know doing what matters um, mm. And he's had a few matches, you know, uh, the, I think the 2019 Wimbledon final against Federer, down 40-15 on Federer's serve. And he's thinking about, you know, the doubts that he has. And he reminded, he, this is in his press conference transcript, that he reminded himself that he deserved to be there and he was the better player. Mm. And it sort of helped him kind of snap back to getting focused and, and, and eventually winning that match. And so some of that comes from maybe mental training. Some of it comes through the experience of having played tennis at a high level for so long that just maybe naturally you start to be able to, to deal with, with some of those things. And so um, are there, you know, when we talk about Djokovic and his mental training, a lot of it's visualization and, mm -hmm. and how he looks at certain things and he sees himself coming through in, in various situations that he tries to predict beforehand. Um, any thoughts on that, Laura, from a, a, a coping strategy perspective, like rehearsing your response to what is going on? Yeah, certainly. So actually at the moment, the uh, tennis academy I do some work at, so Cultivate Academy, which is uh, kind of based in Yorkshire, we're putting together a bit of a mindfulness program at, at the moment. And some of the key things we have in there is this visualization side of things. So we, we've kind of got probably like two main ones, I suppose. So one being like the best self visualization. So what do you look like at your, at your best? What would we see you doing? How does it feel? Um, but then also the overcoming challenges one. So yeah, we could put in here, you know, getting the athlete to think about what's that stuff that really stresses you out and what coping response are you going to use for, for that? So maybe you're coming back to this. Okay. I'm going to try and get some diffusion. I'm going to get some space away from my thoughts and then I'm going to commit to, um, a strength, for example. So if we can get them to visualize this and practice this process um, as they are visualizing on, on a, you know, on a, on a regular basis, then I think that can certainly help us to use those coping responses in action when we actually get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, so yeah, certainly I think that's a, a nice way that we can practice, practice these things. Yeah. Um, one of the Going back to what we were talking about um, a moment ago in terms of some of the differences between um, ATP, WTA players and, and their responses um, and, and the club level, uh, just something that was crossing my mind might be some of the consequences for, for you know, their, their behavior, how if, if a club player, you know, has a tantrum or, um, you know, is, is berating themselves, how, you know, ultimately um, they, they are maybe more likely to lose the match or maybe their reputation at the club um, could suffer, but um, the professional player that, that could actually impact their livelihood in terms of sponsors being turned off in terms of maybe being suspended from the tour um, mm -hmm. as well as we, we touched upon the, the difference that um, in, in order for a player to, to make it to that level um, I, I would say almost always there, there is the mental training piece that has already taken place to, to get to that level. Um, where th for a club player, that, that's definitely more variable, where some players are, are utilizing um, mental training and, and sports psychology. And um, unfortunately, you know, many, many are not and, and um, are sort of leaving some of these, these aspects of, of their self-talk and of, of um, some of these things to chance. Um, so j j just wanted to, to add that in as well. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think it's an important point. And yeah, I suppose when we think about um, those small margins as well, when we get to that elite level and, and how it is important that, 
you know, maybe those things like the sponsors aren't kind of on our mind whilst we're performing or those things like what's the media going to think of X, Y, and Z or if I respond in this way and smash my, my racket, what's going to happen? And is this going to impact my performance further down the line? So I think all of these kind of contextual factors are working at an elite level. And we've seen, I think, quite a bit in the the kind of media at the moment in terms of mental health within athletes, I think can almost become quite over overwhelming when we think about all of those little things that might be on the player's mind. Um, there's certainly that, yeah, I think that that um, increased risk of just being overwhelmed by that stress. If we almost think about like the, that bucket metaphor, if we are kind of filling that up and filling that up and we're getting past threshold and we're starting to over overspill and we might even start to then see some of these less favorable behaviors then on the court if that stress level is beyond threshold and is too high. So we really do then need to think about what what are the coping responses, coping mechanisms and different outlets for these, you know, elite athletes or or athletes that may be a lower level as well. Um, because there's, there's certainly a lot of a lot of stuff going on that 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 can impact um yeah can can impact these players. So Let's talk a little bit about the sort of the landscape of sports psychology in the UK, because I think here in the United States, my impression is that um, sports psychology in the UK has really become very important. There's a lot of great work being done there, a lot of great professionals coming out of out of the UK. Um, I remember listening to Dan Abraham say that the explosion of this was due to the country being sick of losing to Australia in a number of sports, <laughs> and they had to do something about it. Um, about right. <laughs> <laughs> and because I think when you, you look at some of the work being done, there's a lot of stuff being done with uh, at the Olympic level with Team GB, yeah. um, especially uh, rugby. There's a ton of work being done in, in, in football, soccer. I know that you do some of that, Laura. Um, how about in tennis? You you mentioned you work with Cultivate Academy. Um, you know we're seeing more and more. I think uh, the sports psych or mental training being incorporated into into tennis programs, but I would say still pretty much in the minority. What's it like in England and in the UK in terms of uh, integrating that into academy training or even just uh, with individual players? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think in that that's something that. Cultivate Academy is quite unique in, in that um, there is a lot of um, sports psychology support. So Dr. Laura Crabtree, uh, she's kind of the lead sports psychologist there and has done loads of good work within the academy there, the academy at, at Bolton as well. Um, but there is certainly still space for it to, to, to develop. And I think when I've seen it previously in kind of other tennis centres, there might have been a psych in doing some one-off stuff but it's not necessarily the kind of ongoing um, systems-based work, if you like, where it's really embedded into the environment. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff that goes on as well at kind of Luff Loughborough Uni and at the kind of National Centre too. Um, but I can't speak too much. I, I don't know too much um, myself about um, the work there. But I think it is certainly building. I think there's a lot of space for it. Um, so, yeah, I think we're just going to have to wait and see if we get to the same levels as, like you say, the kind of English Institute of Sport with the kind of Team GB and, and the academy system uh, within football, where, you know, if you are a category one football academy, it is essential that you have a full time psychologist in. Whereas those rules, to my to my knowledge, aren't in place, you know, for every tennis academy within the UK. Um, yeah, and perhaps it should be. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely something I've I've thought about having, um, you know, wh whether whether here or, or across the pond, um, having trying to get to that point where we can, you know, all have more of a systemic approach where, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, as you said, it's built into the curriculum, how it's not just um, every once in a while, we, we add some sports psychology to to our coaching, um, or the the academy's coaching or the um, whatever it may be, the club's coaching, but um, really, really embedding that in. And I think, um, you know, I, I think that's ho hopefully, hopefully we're heading in that direction where um, that's, you know, it, it becomes the norm where I, I, I think a lot about it 
um, for a, a youth development perspective, how um, I think we can hopefully avoid some, some um, certain behavioral patterns um, if, if people are taught some of these uh, coping and stress management um, techniques from, from a young age, how if, if we can equip, um, equip kids with, with a skill set of, of mental training from a young age as they're learning the sport, as they're growing, as they're developing as athletes, that um, you know that that these then these skills don't have to be learned later on in the road when they're in high school or at the university level or the professional level. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such an important, I guess, driving force for for me. And I think my work is that we are trying to develop these youth athletes, not just as tennis players, but as people as well. And you know, not everyone's going to make it. So can we ensure that they're getting something out of their all of that time that they're putting in and really learning about themselves and yeah, learning about how they can best respond to difficult situations to put them in the best place to, you know, overcome tough challenges in the future. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, we're all on the same page on that. If you even talked about emotional intelligence earlier, that those are some things that we can be working on uh, very early with young athletes um, and also with the coaches, I think that that's important that they're saying the right things. You know, you mentioned earlier, potentially using level three think aloud with coaches. Um, I don't know if you've done any of that in tennis, but I remember hearing Amy Whitehead's conversation with Dan Abrahams about, you know, they were working with some coaches uh, on that in football um, and, and so mm-hmm. forth. And um, because I think coaches can – they can have a major influence on how those players develop. They, they talk to them more than say the sports psych might. Although I think perhaps the future of coaching should also be looking at more sports psych education as part of what they, they do so that they can manage that. And I, I feel like that maybe is heading in that direction more so in the UK than in the U S but that I could be wrong about that. But you know, what are your thoughts about the coach's role in all of that, Laura? Yeah, so I think that the more I've been, I guess, within the industry, the more I've recognized that the coach is one of the most important people for us to work with, because that, like you say, they're there day to day. They are able to relay the language that we might be using around psychology, relay some of these messages. So it's there on a day to day basis and are really embedded into that environment. Um, So I think for me, it's become more and more important to do that rather than say, okay, I'm just going to take this player off court and speak to him for an hour. It's like, okay, but then what, how is this actually feeding through? Um, So yeah, for me, I think that's, that's essential and it can be also as a sports psychs working with the coaches to maybe discuss some things about psychology and how they can work that into some of their drills, for example, Um, or even us as psychs trying to get on court a bit ourselves and doing some work there. Um, Yeah, but I I think as well, touching on just then when you mentioned Think Aloud within coaching, we have recently been exploring a little bit using, so getting tennis coaches to use Think Aloud during like a tournament. So this tournament it was um, a little bit more u- unique than most of the tournaments we have in the UK because the coaches were actually allowed to come onto court, I think, I think two or three times during, um, during play, um, which they don't usually get to do at, at these uh, kind of youth tournaments. And what was really interesting there is that we were, as the coaches were thinking aloud, so as they were watching the play, they're thinking about their thinking, they're really starting to... Um, I guess, reflect and kind of make sense of when they perhaps need to intervene, what sort of language do they need to use with that athlete when they get on the court and do that. Also managing managing the, the coach's kind of own emotions, for example, or their own biases based on what's the point outcome. And is that having an influence over how they're perceiving their athlete is playing? So I think that that was a really interesting experiment that we did with Think Aloud and then, yeah, getting the the coach to then go on court, intervene, and then thinking out loud again more with the player whilst they're actually there at the side of the court. So I think there's, a, the, again, a lot of versatility with it. And, and I think there's a lot of power in it for coaches. I know some, some coaches we've done interviews with in the past have said it's almost like a little coach on their shoulder because, mm-hmm. you know, it, they're just reflecting with themselves. And 
um, yeah, I, I think that there's a, a really nice space there for think alive within tennis as well, because it, it, you can step back into your own space, think aloud, whereas, you know, in some sports, it might be more difficult for, for coaches to do that. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's um, we're going to try at Cultivate Academy to get the coaches to think aloud, but getting the players to think aloud too. So it's not, you know, or, or judging each other about, you know, how we're performing. It's like, no, we're in this together. Like this is a, you know, a community thing and we can all share our development with one another. It's not just the players that are trying to develop, but the coaches as well. So, yeah, I think we can have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, no, I, I really like what, what what you're doing there and what you're explaining um, at the academy level. I think um, number one, it normalizes some of these thoughts that yeah. hey, if I if I see that my coach and my my peers are all having similar thoughts and we're all working um, through this together and all um, learning and growing at the same time, I, I think that that really makes makes a big impact there. So um, I definitely like like that. Have you um, have you thought a little bit? more about um that that level three you were talking about and its application with coaches um do you see at some point that um being applied to to athletes as well and um you know probably more on on the practice court i would imagine than um, Mm -hmm. on tournament day but um is there do do you see a potential application for for that level three with with Mm -hmm. athletes yeah so it's not something that we've put into practice ourselves yet but something we were kind of brainstorming is can the players use level two whilst they're kind of in, in between points, but then maybe at that switch of ends, maybe they're sitting down getting a drink, whatever. Can they use level three in, in that space so they're kind of prepping themselves ready for the, for the next game? So I think there's certainly scope for that there. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and something else that we can do, um, which again, isn't maybe isn't as accurate because of course it, it Um, as actually doing it in action but we can get athletes to use level three on action so let's say for example they're watching back a video recording of their performance perhaps they're using level kind of three think aloud there when they are kind of verbalizing what are they seeing what are they doing why did I choose to do this particular shot what maybe could I have done differently so you can use think aloud retrospectively in that way too um, and that could be a space where athletes and, and coaches might be able to sit down together and kind of do that sort of thing. I think another fascinating moment, Laura, might be right right after the match ends. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a reaction on both sides. And it, it'd be interesting to yeah. understand, okay, how does one appraise oneself after a win or after a loss? And if there's some sort of level three to that. Yeah, definitely. And I think if we can catch that as quick as possible, kind of after that, that um, match is finished, then that can yeah be really powerful. And um, yeah, I think there's certainly a lot of scope for it in that space too. Yeah. So, that, that, go ahead, Josh. No, I was going to say that I, I like that, Brian. And I think um, at, whether it's the change of ends, the changeover where you have, you know, generally 90 seconds, or maybe a, a set break or in between matches, that's where you have the time to reflect a little bit more about your thoughts where it's not just um, having, you know, saying the thoughts out loud or incorporating some of the different senses, but it's, you actually have the time to um, sit down and, and to, to analyze them a little bit. So I, I, I could definitely yeah. see that being helpful as well. I think, yeah. Go ahead, Laura. No, oh, I was just, um, it's maybe a slight tangent, but I was going to say that something that, Um, I've explored a little bit with kind of myself as a sports psychology practitioner in terms of using this kind of level three think aloud, perhaps after I've done a consultation like with a player um, and using it in that way, then to kind of just get a bit, bit more of my own views kind of down on recording to listen back and reflect on. I think um, one of the things I like about this is that I guess a, a, a piece of my practice is trying to help athletes or players develop what I call a personal philosophy, meaning develop better ideas behind their thinking. And by actually studying your thinking, you can begin to develop better ideas. And and perhaps that's a longer term strategy in terms of helping to cope and appraise something, you know, like 
whether it's just challenge mindset or, or something else, the, the idea of using better ideas instead of sort of defaulting to loss aversion or avoiding unpleasant emotions and, and that type of stuff, can we have a better philosophy around that? And this, I think, really provides some sort of rich detail and content in order to study what one's sort of personal philosophy is now and how do we, how do we improve those ideas behind your thinking? Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think I always think how like awareness is the start to change, right? And I think that Think Aloud can be great there in that we are starting to become more aware of what's there initially, what's there in the first place, so that we can start to build upon, like you say, whether it's personal philosophy, personal kind of way of thinking, personal approaches to match day, whatever it might be. But we've got to get that initial awareness, that initial kind of ability to contact you know what's happening in the present moment and and i think yeah i think that can be great to to start that off and get the ball rolling well, josh i look forward to reading your transcripts of think aloud of you on the court at, down in newport <laughs> 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 i think no i think i think for yeah no i i i um i think back to some some of my matches in the past at, at different levels and uh yeah, reading reading those would, would definitely reading the transcripts from those um, would, would definitely be interesting. Some of the the ways I've talked to myself or um, thought about the situation at hand, or maybe even talked about the opponents. So um, no, I, I think uh, I think even the the very act of saying it out loud um, can 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 even influence um, how how a player might behave or or what type of thoughts um, what type of thoughts you might be having, knowing that. Hey, this is going to be heard by by other people. Hey, my coach could be hearing this, or my peers, um, for instance, at your academy. Um, so I I, I I think there's a really a ton of benefit here, and I I look forward to utilizing this more with some of the players that I work with. Yeah, and and just some feedback from some of the uh, kind of tennis players I've used it with is that actually it does help them to become more in the moment and kind of more focused in on what's happening there, you know, during the game on the court. Um, because you are constantly back to, okay, what am I thinking? What, and, and saying that out loud. So I think that, yeah, there are benefits just through, if, if you're simply just using it in the moment, whilst you're on court, kind of great, like every now and then. Um, so even if you're not, say, going away and listening back to it and pulling it apart, I think that just giving it a go and trying it out can, can accrue its own benefits. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. And as we've said, you know, in a sport like tennis, you absolutely need to be in the in the present moment to to compete well um, and to be fully focused. So, Laura, perhaps just to wrap up our conversation, what what are you doing these days? You know, is there anything interesting that you're working on, or is there anything interesting that um, um, that we should be looking out for from you? Yeah. So, well, actually, recently in the last kind of few weeks, I've left. Um, my role within in football to focus a bit more on tennis awesome so hopefully yeah you'll see more of me in the kind of tennis um yeah tennis side of things so like i say working with cultivate academy we're really trying to push some kind of player psychology programs there and getting that um yeah integrating that more it's still really integrated already from you know uh, Laura Crabtree, who's done a lot of work there. But I think that will be really exciting. And we're, again, looking at building some like online mindfulness programs along with some other ones in the future, which will be, yeah, fun, fun to see how, how that goes. And then on the side of that, I suppose a bit, a little bit away from, from tennis is I, I've recently started doing more work within esports. So uh, we've just brought out a new um, BSC course. So in esports performance uh, and kind of coaching performance, which is going to be at Portsmouth University, like a distant learning course. So I think that's going to be quite exciting to see where esports goes, see where sports psychology can come in to help developing players, developing um, yeah, the, the coaches in that space as well. And who knows? I think Tennis World Tour might, you know, be showing up a couple of times. I think um I think they already have some esports series. I think is it Roland Garris? I think might um, host an esports series for for yeah tennis world tour. So it might go that way. 
Fantastic. Well, Laura, thanks again for joining us today on the on the Tennis IQ podcast. Great conversation. We look forward to staying in touch with you. So thank you again. No, thank you guys. It's great to chat and yeah, you're giving me a lot to go in and think about too. So yeah, thanks very much. Well, that was a great conversation, Brian. Um, I would say my um, one of the things that stood out most to me about the conversation was um, Think Aloud's connection to self-awareness as well as mindfulness. Um, it, it stood out how she talked about um, with level two, really incorporating the senses, um, uh, which we talk about a lot with um, visualization and imagery in terms of making that that moment um, as you're visualizing um, feel more realistic. Um, but also, um, as we talk about mindfulness and really connecting to that present moment, we often talk about really incorporating the senses. Um, so that that's that first piece. But as it relates to self-awareness, just the act, the very act of saying your thoughts out loud and, and actually hearing them, um, as well as perhaps hearing the thoughts of others, whether they be your peers or your coaches, um, can lead to a lot of self-awareness because you're, you're, you start to recognize actually what you're saying, where generally our self-talk is in our head and we, we can't hear it, nobody else can hear it, um, but by actually being able to uh, physically hear those words, it can it can help us say wow are we actually saying those things um so and it can it can definitely lead to a lot of behavior change and can can lead to us being more aware of the way that we talk to ourselves and and the way that we talk to others and the way that we're appraising a situation so that um that self-awareness mindfulness piece was was definitely something that, that stood out to me and i think with that awareness i think one of the reasons to, you to use something like think aloud is to help with perhaps the loss of memory over time. So it's after a match, you may report what your self-talk was, but this is really capturing it in the moment. And, and like you said, it helps build that self-awareness. Uh, it just seems like a really fascinating way to study the way people think. Uh, you know, she, Laura talked about level one, level two, level three. Um, and I think if, if someone can become um, proficient at Think Loud, be very interesting to see how they can begin to change their level three piece, right? The thinking behind the thinking, uh, starting to create better ideas behind your thinking. Uh, it would be really interesting to work with a player, understand what their thoughts and self-talk are sort of like prior to an engagement and then work with them, whether that be on mindfulness training or awareness or acceptance, or uh, maybe you're working more on the rational side of things and then examining sort of post that post some training how that may differ and you know having the player see the difference and i'm sure that could continue to get better and better so it seems like there are really some fascinating lines of research and use for this protocol and and although i think some training is certainly required and and laura talked about how they did that in their study um even just getting used to doing it probably would provide some some awareness and, and insight for players so um, really fascinating topic. And um, I guess the other piece is, you know, stress and coping was one of the big things that we were trying to get to. It'd be interesting to look at that and understand more about, okay, are there, with, a, with respect to coping, uh, are there strategies that work best, maybe in certain situations, or maybe they're more individualized. Maybe some people want more problem-focused or need more problem-focused strategies versus emotion-focused strategies. Um, and maybe why do people go into avoidance? One of the things we talked about, Josh, when we discussed mental fortitude training was, uh, there needs to be an appraisal of, do I even have the coping skills to deal with this situation? And, you know, is that occurring there? So I think between think loud, stress and coping, a lot of great stuff here for us to think about other sports site professionals and coaches for sure to, to think about. So well, that's our show for today. Many thanks to our guest, Dr. Laura Swettenham. Uh, and thank you for listening. For more on today's episode, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check out our Instagram page. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.